Hello everyone, I'm Shannon Piper, Editorial Director for GEMS. I'd like to welcome you to this webcast, Data Drives Care. Before we get started today, I'd like to ask everyone to answer a few multiple choice questions related to the content of this presentation. We'll be revisiting your answers to the questions about halfway through the presentation. The questions should appear on your screen right now. If they don't, you may have your pop-up blocker on. Please turn it off. While you're answering the questions, I'll proceed with some logistics. As EMS providers, you're all familiar with the cardiac chain of survival. But as new technologies emerge and data collection becomes easier, a new chain of survival is emerging, the data and technology chain. In today's presentation, Dr. Greg Mears will look at some of the specific areas where data collection and use is transforming EMS. A few housekeeping notes. At the end of this presentation, we'll take a break to answer your questions. You can submit a question at any time by typing into the Ask a Question field. Please don't use this field, however, for answering the poll questions. The webcast will be archived on GEMS.com within 48 hours of this live event. And you can log in as many times as you want. You can share it with your colleagues. And you can download a PDF of the presentation as well. I'd like to get us started today by thanking our sponsors. This webcast is being brought to you by joint support from Zoll, Image Trend, Santio, First Watch, and Ferno. We appreciate their support. I'm going to give you just about a minute more to answer those questions, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Thanks very much. And again, we'll be uh, getting to those answers halfway through the presentation. Dr. Greg Mears is the Medical Director for Zoll, specializing in data, systems of care, and EMS performance improvement. Through the nonprofit Emergency Performance Inc., Dr. Mears leads the development of the National Fire Operations Reporting System. He's an adjunct professor in emergency medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and has served in multiple EMS leadership roles with, within North Carolina and nationally. We're certainly glad to have Dr. Mears here today to share his knowledge. And now, I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Shannon. Um, this this uh, webinar really is a uh, interesting experience because this is not necessarily new information that I'm going to be providing to you. Hopefully, what it is is just a a really reversioning of information that you know into a useful format or a useful structure to think about things. Because we have moved forward as an industry, uh, both with technology, both with, or excuse me, also with our skill sets and, and clinical capacities. Uh, but all of this molds together operationally and clinically uh, with a very strong foundation of data. And so I think this concept of a of a chain of survival that's based on how you use data within your organization is key to your success uh, in the future of your organization as well as to the clinical success uh, in your patient care endeavors. So I thought I would start with a little bit of history. Uh, many of you recognize this. This is the star of life. Uh, this uh, was actually copyrighted and developed by the NHTSA Office of EMS back, uh, I believe, in the early 70s. Um, it has a representation of having uh, several points, which as you go around clockwise, they represent uh, the delivery of service and care from an EMS perspective. So at the top of the star, there's early detection. Uh, that's recognition of the event. Uh, we then have early reporting, which is uh, at the time not necessarily even 911 was an option in many areas. but. Uh, certainly today, the concept of calling 911 and activation of the system. 
an early response by EMS that could be both uh, or either a first responder or definitive care. Uh, the actual care that's delivered on the scene of the event, and then care as that patient is transported from the scene to a hospital or to definitive care, uh, and then finally uh, taking into account uh, some patients even have to be transferred from facility to facility to get to higher levels of care. So this is a very early uh, essentially chain of survival from the structure of EMS operations. Um, it's interesting if our friend here uh, got approval to use the uh, Star of Life as his tattoo from a copyright perspective. But let's take a look next at really the next document that shaped EMS from the standpoint of its structure and its operations. And that was the EMS Agenda for the Future. Uh, this came out in the mid-90s. Um, it was a document which really described EMS in a futuristic approach. It took uh, a, really an angle of what we're doing now, what we need to be doing in the future, and then how do we get there. But out of that document came this concept that EMS is more than just taking care of patients outside of the hospital. Uh, Ricardo Martinez uh, wrote the intro to the Agenda for the Future, and in that he described EMS as the intersection of public health, public safety, and health care understanding that EMS cannot separate itself from either of those three rings and really has to represent all of those in its operations and in the care that it provides. The next thing uh, from a graphics perspective that came out was this concept of a system of care. And this was uh, ongoing at the time that the EMS agenda, EMS agenda for the future was done. But this is really a more detailed or complex example or representation of how we have to manage each patient event with a system of care approach. This still has a concept that it starts at the top, it moves uh, clockwise with the recognition of an event, uh, accessing EMS through 911, uh, dispatch, which can include a lot more things uh, than just uh, sending uh, an ambulance to the scene. It also encompasses things that we're going to get into that now are very heavily relying upon CAD and data and, and, uh, and navigation type systems. The response may be a first responder without transport, a basic life support uh, at the EMT basic level, or an advanced life support with a higher level of care. And it may even be layered across all three of these, depending on the severity of the event and the information that is obtained and used at the time of dispatch. Uh, finally, there is a transport of the patient uh, that could be through ground or air. Uh, that is typically to an emergency department, but that may be an emergency department facility at a local community, or it may be associated with specialty care, uh, such as that care needed for a stroke or a cardiac arrest or trauma. Um, are STEMI. And then finally, this system of care approach starts to really pull EMS into the rest of healthcare so that we also think about things like rehabilitation, getting that patient back into their community in the healthiest or the, the best uh, condition possible. How do we address things from a prevention and an education perspective so that maybe we can reduce the incidence of certain uh, types of events and actually improve the community's health as a whole. So this concept of system of care is one that um, I think we have all endorsed, certainly in the U.S., but I think locally, especially as EMS is integrating more with health care, uh, strangely enough, hospitals and health systems sometimes have less of an understanding of this system of care than we do after providing this service for all of these years. On the clinical side, uh, back you know, since the early 80s, uh, American Heart uh, came out with this concept of the chain of survival. Uh, we're all familiar with this. Uh, most of us have taken CPR courses or ACLS courses or PALS courses, where the concept of the key uh, components of survival are identified in a link of this chain. And the only way to really optimally reach the most positive outcome is to make sure that you address each of these, these chains of survival. 
So the concept of early intervention access, CPR defibrillation, advanced care, and there's even been an extra chain added onto this here recently as we focused on hypothermia and really more intensive post-resuscitation care. But the concept is still one the same, just as it is from the slides that we've had previously, that this is a, an ongoing process. It is a chain of survival. Uh, each link has an important role in making sure that outcomes are positive. Recently, here in the last five to eight years, we've had a movement which is known as the culture of safety. And this is really a movement that began back when the Institute of Medicine came out with a report highlighting errors in medicine and how even with best intentions, sometimes uh, through errors we were creating or causing harm. And that harm is one way to look at that, and that's the way the IOM report uh, pictured it, was the impact on the patient. But we also know that there's an impact on the healthcare provider. And here's an example of a culture of safety that really addresses both the safety of the patient and the healthcare provider. This is a driver feedback mechanism where using technology within a vehicle, you're able to provide real-time feedback to the driver on unsafe habits or behaviors associated with driving. And then through that feedback, you not only improve the safety of the transporter on that on that specific vehicle at that moment, you also build a level of, of safety in the behavior of that driver in the future, and that can be trended, it can be benchmarked, and it can be uh, improved or maintained over time. So this concept of using technology, using data, providing feedback in a timely fashion when the user can use that, learn and apply that, and then retain that, are things that go a long ways to ensure, in this case, a culture of safety for both the healthcare provider as well as the patient. So if we piece all of this together, uh, this was really the idea behind this GEM supplement, and that's that we have really created a chain of survival that is based on data and technology. And that survival is both the survival of a patient, but also the survival of your organization to maintain its, its healthiness so that it can compete and sustain itself in our environment when certainly uh, the economy, health care reform, costs of providing care, all of these things are not always predictable. Uh, we can maintain our survival and make sure that we're providing a quality level of service and a high level of care. Uh, if we apply data and technology appropriately. So our goal is that we wanted to spend some time on this webinar with you to really describe what this chain of survival might look like, but really at the end what we end up doing is introducing you to the different types of technology that are used along this path or along this circle as we go around clockwise from that recognition of event all the way through to, to definitive care, prevention, and, and all of the things that are necessary for uh, an organization to, uh, to be responsive and, and to provide a high quality of service. So one of the things that I always put out front uh, before I go too deeply into a subject is to, to give you a little bit of my bias. And certainly as a medical director, uh, as an EMS physician for, for years, uh, I have always believed, and I think everyone on this call would agree with me, that EMS is the practice of medicine. Uh, we are not an adjunct, we're not a transport service, we're not a component that makes sure the rest of medicine uh, does something that we don't. We often provide uh, a higher level of care sometimes than the receiving locations we transport patients. And certainly, if we're not integrated with the rest of healthcare, then this system of care approach to make sure the outcome is optimal for whatever the condition the patient has, uh, we lose that ability. So we have to understand and, and acknowledge and convince those around us in the healthcare community that EMS is part of the practice of medicine, and we have to be brought to the table in those discussions. 
The second thing that's important uh, from for this discussion as well, but also I think it's it's a uh, it's structurally inherent uh, to to understand to have a successful organization with EMS is that our operations often can't be separated from the care that we provide. I mean, classic examples are cardiac arrest. We have a minimum response time to be able to make a positive difference, so we have to include the operations associated with a quick response to a positive outcome of cardiac arrest. Uh, there are many more examples than that, but I think the concept here is that understanding that our operations are just as critical to a positive uh, clinical outcome as the actual care that's provided to that patient on many cases. Third, it's very important for us to acknowledge that it is our responsibility to be a bridge and not an island to this healthcare system. Uh, we often find ourselves being uh, really the, the duct tape that holds the system together sometimes. Uh, patients not only need the appropriate recognition and assessment and care from a pre-hospital perspective, but many, many times these patients need to get to the right place and the right time for the appropriate intervention to occur. And so we need to be the bridge that makes sure this happens. We're not operating in a silo like we have been uh, you know, historically now. We have to communicate. We have to understand what the capacity and the capabilities of the healthcare system that we operate in and make sure that we put the patient in the best uh, situation or in the best um, environment for a positive outcome. And then finally, and this is a lot of the rest of this discussion, is I want you to really start entertaining the concept that the software you use, whether that's a patient care reporting system, maybe it's a navigation system, maybe it's a dispatch system, whatever that software is that you use daily within your service and with your operations, as well as the medical devices you use to help assess and analyze a patient's condition, these are now much, much more than just a tool that you have in your tool belt. We have moved to the point, and I kind of kid sometimes from the Terminator series that, you know, the machines have become self-aware. Uh, but in many ways, uh, these devices and the software that runs within the devices and within the, the computer programs and, and software packages that you use, they have become aware. They do understand through business analytics and intelligence often what is going on. They can be taught or told how to help you to make sure that you protect the patient, uh, maybe through safety checks to make sure you're not administering medications where they're allergic. Uh, they can help you from the perspective of uh, understanding maybe what the protocol is for this patient that should be done or that should be followed and to make sure that you follow all of the requirements within that protocol and even alert you, maybe before you would even notice from an assessment perspective that this patient is in need of some level of care or monitoring in addition to what you're currently providing. So all of this is based on this concept that software and devices are more than tools, and we do need to start looking at them from being a, as a member of our healthcare team. The one last piece of information I would point or at least provide you about this is that there is part of the pr approval process for software and devices through the FDA really is put in place or the purpose of that FDA approval is to show that the software or the device has the ability to objectively react to information and provide consistent feedback uh, based on the design and the algorithms that are used. Uh, so software and devices that have FDA approval, especially software uh, in the healthcare information realm, such as patient care reports, we should really be looking for software that is FDA approved to be able to provide this level of insight and guidance. So what I thought I would do is go through, to me, what I would think would be a perfect EMS event. And what I mean by that, if all of this technology, if all of these devices and all of the people that are using them were to come together and on one EMS event, all of this worked flawlessly 
what would that look like? And so over the next several slides, what I'm going to do is give you my perspective of what a perfect day would be from an EMS event. And so we're going to start in the dispatch center. Uh, we're notified that there's a motor vehicle crash. Along with this crash, we get an automated feed of information from the vehicle through telematics, which tells us that it's a low speed or a low, low velocity crash, front end collision, that there's one occupant in that vehicle. Uh, along with this feed, uh, dispatch is able to quickly locate exactly the GPS coordinates of the vehicle understand uh, from the information feed that's fed from the vehicle that it is a low-speed accident and the likelihood of injury from the crash itself is very low. EMD follows through using their software and their protocols and their instructions uh, to obtain information from the occupant of the vehicle. And at the same time they do that, they automatically start uh, feeding electronic data on the vehicle location uh, to identify where the closest vehicle is for a response and make sure that they match the response to the need as far as a motor vehicle crash. Along with this, though, we understand from the telematics who this patient is. We are able to reach out and query the patient's personal health information, and we understand that the patient has a heart condition and was just released from the hospital a few days prior. EMD continues to provide pre-arrival instructions to the patient while EMS is uh, in response. Uh, the response is, is assisted through navigation and technology to make sure that they get there in the most uh, timely and appropriate way. Uh, there is the use of light changing technology, so as they move through intersections, lights automatically change to allow them uh, to get there in the safest fashion without risking the rest of the public and at the same time the information is being loaded, the system is already starting to query uh, based on the location of the scene where the closest hospital or facility that would be able to manage a trauma victim would occur. So on arrival to the scene, EMS is already very much aware of uh, that it's a motor vehicle crash. They're aware of the potential severity of injury. They're aware that there's a patient in this uh, car uh, that has a cardiac condition, and they've already at least started to make some maneuvers as to where their destination may be uh, from a transport per perspective. <clears throat> During their patient care, they attach the patient up to a cardiac monitor uh, using other technologies such as barcode, RFIDs, voice uh, recording, uh, image data, pictures, those kinds of things, they are able to complete a level of documentation that's much more sophisticated than we currently do today uh, with much less interaction on the part of the healthcare care provider. Uh, the documentation that they are providing uh, to the system is, is event driven. Uh, in other words, only the information that's associated with that type of event is being presented for them to interact with and describe. Uh, the monitor and the PCR software even provides suggestions based on the complaint of the patient, the type of scenario uh, with respect to what treatment uh, is needed. Uh, during the care of this patient, a STEMI is identified, and this alters the uh, perspective slightly in that it's no longer just a motor vehicle crash. Uh, this might explain for a low speed crash uh, with a patient with a heart condition, but a STEMI is identified. This requires a change from the perspective of now uh, focusing on getting the patient to their destination, but also activating that destination in a way that they're prepared to meet the, uh, <clears throat> the therapeutic requirements from a, a door to uh, uh, definitive treatment perspective. At the same time, this same patient's medical record obtained through the dispatch uh, was relayed to EMS, is now relayed to that hospital and EMS is able to relay uh, the 12 lead ECG as well as live vital signs and treatment information to that receiving facility so that they are able to follow as this patient uh, progresses through the system. They are taken to a PCI center. Uh, the information that had been relayed is, is received. They are able to accept that patient directly to the cath lab in coordination with the emergency department. 
uh, quickly identifying that there's no obvious injuries associated with the motor vehicle crash. So ultimately, the patient does have a, a door to PCI time, which is uh, positive from an outcome perspective. And EMS is now left with finalizing their documentation, uh, which really is a very simple process, as all of this information that exists in an electronic form is merged into their patient care report. There's very few questions remaining that they would have to complete. And finally, as they complete this, this information is automatically being able to, or is able to be relayed uh, to their billing system so that they can generate a bill for their services, uh, as well as to the hospital to make sure that there's a record of the EMS care uh, within the hospital system as the patient uh, continues to follow uh, through on the system of care. From an evaluation of the EMS perspective, each PCR, once it's complete, can be electronically analyzed based on performance and quality indicators and guidelines that are within the system. Uh, there are registries both on the trauma center side as well as the STEMI side where this information should auto-populate the EMS care of that patient from that registry requirements. Uh, all of this can be done, again, through the electronic exchange of information. Once this information is analyzed, that event can also be grouped with other events so that all of the STEMI patients for that quarter, uh, the trauma patients for that quarter can be analyzed in an aggregate fashion. Uh, anything from just identifying types of accidents to other demographic parameters that would help the EMS agency and the community better manage this in the future or apply prevention and education tactics would be identified. And so a tool is immediately put into play uh, to start uh, any kind of education or prevention program that might be needed based on that event. In the back end also, through this documentation, through the RFIDs and the use of supplies during the care of this patient, these supplies are, um, are the, the list of supplies associated with this patient event are known. Uh, this allows for uh, the ambulance to be easily restocked. It also allows you over time to keep a real time or um, a very uh, reactive uh, uh, minimal supply uh, stock based on your operations to keep your costs down. Again, the billing is generated automatically, which would increase your um, uh, or decrease your time from bill to collection. Uh, all of the care that's rendered by the EMS professionals can also be tracked through the system so that training and education and credentialing can be more easily maintained. And even vehicle information can be relayed to make sure that the maintenance on the vehicle is in the best possible uh, uh, condition so that it can be anticipated so that uh, unanticipated failures uh, will not impact not only the operations of your system but even the care potentially of that next patient. So all of this comes together from the perspective of, of that perfect day. So I believe I want to stop here and hand back to Shannon. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mears. Um, this is a good time where we're going to go ahead and take a break and look at some of the results from our survey questions that we started with. And we're going to go ahead and send those results out to the audience, so you should be able to see them momentarily. And then, um, Dr. Mears, I'm assuming that you can see those results as well. If you navigate to the surveys, area, you should be able to see the results, and I'll kind of leave it up to you to, to look at the highlights. And if you're having any trouble seeing those, just let me know. Shannon, did you want me to go through these, or just let people look at them? Um, you know, if you see any highlights that you'd like to, um, to read out to the audience or comment on, that you, know, you can do that, or we can go through them one by one, or just kind of however you want to take it. I'm happy to go through them really quickly. Uh, you know, these are questions that I had uh, come up with uh, to try to better understand how the EMS industry is moving along on some of these uh, technology ideas that are being presented uh, during this presentation. The first question was, are you currently obtaining outcome data from your hospitals? This has always been a challenge for EMS. It's very difficult for us to adjust our service and our care without understanding what happens to the 
patients based on the baseline care that we provide. And so of the respondents, um, it looks like almost half of the respondents are able to get some kind of outcome data based by a phone-to-phone -phone kind of exchange um, with the hospital. Um, a 40% or so of the, uh, the group do not get any outcome data. Uh, and then there are um, an automated uh, perspective on about 6% and then 12% uh, follow up with the hospital in person. So our goal is really to try to move this to where 100% are getting electronic outcome back from hospitals. And as you can see, um, there's a lot of effort to get outcome data, even if you get this in follow up. It's often hard to get this into a data system to where it's easy to analyze. The next question is, what percent of your trips do you currently obtain outcome data on? And it looks like uh, the, the choices were A, uh, A through E, with each one being essentially a 20% increment. So 0 to 20% was the response of, of about 3 quarters uh, of the, uh, the participants. And so the next highest was 20 to 40 percent. But only 6 percent say they're getting between 80 and 100 percent of the outcome information. So again, opportunities for, for technology and data and to improve this. The next question is, do you currently run reports across products following a patient from dispatch to PCR to billing? And this is a linkage kind of question. We all have maybe a billing software, a dispatch software, a PCR software. They often reside in different areas of the operations, and they're often not connected. And so you can see from this question that roughly only 50% of the responses are able to connect the data from dispatch to PCR to billing, another goal of integrating healthcare data. The next question is if you answered number three, which was yes, to the uh, able to link or, or pull this data across, what tools do you use to run reports across products? And again, there were five choices. Um, uh, the one is, is RescueNet reporting, certainly, which is our, our Zoll solution. But SQL queries, Excel spreadsheets, other tools, and I don't run reports across products. And so the, the largest response, about a third, was we currently don't run these reports. Um, and then uh, either the Zoll Rescue Net or other tools were uh, the next two highest options. The next question is, how confident are you that you're obtaining the necessary insight from your data? In other words, are you really able to learn from it and apply it? And here we were given four choices very confident, pretty confident, somewhat confident, and basics are basic. And 50%, which was the highest response, was just basic. I'm seeing basic information, and I'm sure I'm missing a lot of insight from my data. 28% um, or 29% said they're somewhat confident they're seeing some critical information, but there's a lot more that they could, they could potentially see uh, with better tools. Uh, B is pretty confident. I'm seeing most of what I need to see, but I'm sure there's more insight there. And then only 5% were very confident they're seeing exactly what they need. The last question is, what area of your EMS agency is in need of the most improvement? And again, four choices, business operations, dispatch, response, and bystander care. And by far the winner at almost 60% was business operations. Um, and again, um, you can't separate the business operations from the care and the service delivery that we provide. And so uh, I think this is a very realistic answer and one that really supports this concept of a data and technology chain of survival for your organization. So I will stop right there. Shannon, anything else that you need to see or, or say? No, I think that's, those are some fascinating responses and show us uh, just the potential for, you know, how far we have to, to go and, you know, where the, where the needs are. And um, especially that, that last question kind of stood out to me because I know a lot of the time we don't like to think about EMS as a business, but it, it certainly is. And um, it's that, that aspect of it integrates into, into every other aspect. So 
I appreciate everybody answering the questions. And I also just wanted to um, take this opportunity as well, again, to thank our sponsors, uh, Zoll, Image Trend, Sanzio, First Watch, and Ferno for making the presentation possible. And a reminder to everybody on the line, we, do, we will be taking some questions at the end. So if you would like to submit a question, you can use that Ask a Question field anytime between now and the end of the presentation. And Dr. Maris, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. So what I want to do now, after giving you that example, and then also uh, we can get a sense from the, the survey questions that we had, let's go through each of these areas from the standpoint of a link um, concept. So let's look at each of these links in this data and technology chain of survival. And I'm not going to go into great detail for each of these, but I do just want to mention some of the technology that's there. And then that's still, I believe, going to give us some time at the end for some questions. So if you have questions, you can uh, type them in, and we'll get them queued up and try to go through as many of those as we can here um, uh, towards the end of the presentation. So the first place that we want to start in this uh, chain is at the uh, dispatch level. And uh, Jerry Overton uh, did a great job of writing this piece uh, in the data supplement. and, and his concept was that the dispatch center is really becoming the clinical hub of an EMS agency. And the concept behind this is that we have a, a requirement within our operations to make sure that we do get a very timely response to every EMS event. And that response is based to some degree on the type of event and the type of response, excuse me, the type of response it requires, but still it should be a consistent response for those events. And the only way that we can assure that is by having a, a very high quality dispatch system or center uh, that manages that information. Uh, it has to pull in information from multiple sources. Uh, certainly the CAD or the computer, computer augmented dispatch system is critical because this gives us a mapping of our phone system to a GIS location, uh, but also uh, the use of emergency medical dispatch, the key questions, obtaining uh, information about the event so that we can connect its location to where our resources are and then have an understanding of the care that's needed is critical. Uh, as we transition sort of out of this clinical hub, um, we have to think about some other technology that's coming into play. I think one is the ability to offload low priority calls to uh, nurse phone systems or other types of uh, dis excuse me, triage systems that can potentially uh, provide care without an EMS response. I think we also have to understand the impact of many data systems that are starting to interface at the dispatch center, which could be anything from identifying patients that are technology dependent in the time of emergency so that we make sure that they have oxygen and electricity. Uh, if there is a disaster, to identifying where uh, automated defibrillators and even uh, using technology to uh, reach out to first responders for very timely specific things like cardiac arrest. All of these data systems are helpful, but they only work if they interface through this clinical hub in a timely way to make sure that each patient gets the right care in the right time. The next link in this uh, is what we really term safety on the streets. So uh, we can identify the need, we can move the resources in that direction, but if they don't get there or there are issues associated with that response, we still don't provide the best level of care. And this also has that safety issue from a culture of safety perspective to not only uh, protect the patient, but also the healthcare providers and even the community that we interact with as we are responding. So currently ambulance crashes, and again, I, I should have said this at the beginning, I want to thank Dave McGowan. He wrote this piece uh, for the data supplement and did a great job of outlining uh, the technology and, and the need for uh, this type of technology for EMS. But ambulance crashes are the number one cause of EMS provider injuries and death. And we do need to make sure that we do all we can to protect our own. Uh, on the same uh, perspective, um, there is a significant number of injuries uh, and deaths that occur to patients being transported by EMS. 
And so the concept of providing a safe level of transport uh, and making sure that all of our response technology, uh, I mentioned in the uh, perfect event, light changing technology and other technologies that help to make the pathway from uh, the uh, responding location to the scene location as safe as possible is something we have to consider in our uh, culture of safety and in this uh, IT and data chain of survival. I want to thank Ben Bobro uh, for writing this uh, piece within the data supplement on how we're starting to use data and technology, especially for CPR and for cardiac arrest. And there are three kinds of technology that are in play, and you're going to see many, much more of their development here over the next several years. Uh, one is certainly having an understanding of where AEDs are located from a public access perspective across the community. Uh, second, and this is often a, a, a registry uh, type application, there are several of them, and, and one of the challenges that we have in the future is we've got to make sure that these registries talk or that we can query each of these registries because it's not uncommon for a community to have uh, two or three different products that provide an AED location service, but if we can't query all three of them, then uh, we might not always find the AED in a timely fashion, even when it's listed in a registry for us to go look for. Uh, along with identifying and quickly identifying the AED location based on the location of the cardiac arrest, we want to make sure that we start CPR and defibrillation as soon as possible. So there are multiple applications out there that are working at the social media level to make sure that you can put out a call to everyone using that application, that social media application, to know where there is a cardiac arrest, where the closest AED is to that arrest, and then make sure that they're mobilized quickly with the idea that uh, they can likely get there being in that area uh, before EMS can formally respond. And certainly uh, minutes uh, result to lives. And, and this type of interaction using technology and, and data uh, can really make a positive impact on the survival of victims of cardiac arrest. And then finally, the last type of information and technology associated with cardiac arrest are the use of registries. And in this sense, I'm, uh, the main registry would be CARES, the cardiac arrest uh, uh, resuscitation uh, or outcomes uh, registry. Uh, this is a way to aggregate data from your own agency and compare it with other agencies so that you can learn from a performance improvement and a process improvement process how to better take care of patients, how to truly measure the outcome of your cardiac arrest. Uh, incidents and survival within your system and build this system of care uh, that's positive for a cardiac arrest system of care. Um, I went through my aspect or my perspective of this uh, in the example early in this presentation, but uh, the piece that I uh, personally wrote in the data summit was really a call to start integrating the existing information that's out there and to start really looking to uh, include and, and again take the tools off the tool belt and really include the data and the technology as part of your healthcare team. So help let the devices and the data help you from a decision support perspective. Let them help you to make sure that you're following protocols. Let them help you to improve your documentation and decrease your documentation time. And then finally, this will all give you the benefit, if it's done and integrated well, to having better measurement to understand your outcomes and then in include performance improvement processes so that you can improve the care and the service delivery that you provide. The next article in the data supplement uh, was written by Ray Fowler. Uh, he did a great job of really describing how we move the patient from the field to the emergency department and really the needs of information flow as we do that. And the concept here, uh, his focus was more on a STEMI um, process of identifying patients with STEMIs uh, or acute MIs or myocardial infarctions out in the EMS realm 
making sure that we collect the data, which you know, could include a 12-lead ECG and other data points, uh, transmit or get those to the right person uh, at the specialty care center, whether that be the emergency department or the cardiologist or the cath lab, so that there can be a coordinated activation of that specialty center and then make sure that it's a flawless uh, uh, transition as that patient moves very quickly through, uh, ideally not even stopping in the ED, straight through uh, from the EMS uh, ambulance into the cath lab for definitive treatment and care. And then also understanding as we aggregate this information on the back end, understanding the outcomes, understanding the performance markers and the timelines associated with those so that they can be adjusted and that we can learn uh, from each case and continue to have an improvement uh, through the system of care analysis and, and approach. Uh, Mick Gunderson uh, uh, wrote a great piece on really starting to look at the exchange of information and then on performance improvement. And this is a uh, probably the area that we need most within EMS, but it's also uh, the one that relies the most on having electronic data and health information exchange so that data across systems can be shared. And so part of this is understanding what health information exchange is and what's the definition of that. And it's certainly an exchange of outcome, or outcome information uh, or health information in, in both directions. Uh, one, you know, EMS says they hand off and transition a patient's care to a hospital or to another health care provider. Electronic information should flow with that patient. And then once the outcome or outcome measurements of that patient are known at that next level, whether that be the emergency department or the hospital admission, uh, when they're discharged, that information can be fed back in return so that each healthcare provider or each location along that chain of, of the system of care can understand the impact of their care on the outcome of the patient. And I think of this from the standpoint of health information change. Uh, you know, my definition of healthy information exchange from an EMS perspective is that we look at this from a patient care perspective, we look at it from an access to electronic records, and then we look at it from our ability to optimize or improve care. So from a patient care perspective, it's important that we make sure, it's important that the patient receive quality care. And it's important that the healthcare provider, in this sense the EMS provider, provide that. So how does information help us to do that? I think one is access to the patient's electronic health record at the time of their care. So if we are uh, seeing a patient out in the community that just left their physician's office last week or were admitted recently, we should have access to that information so that we understand what medications they're supposed to be on, we understand what their diagnosis is, we understand who cares for them in an ongoing fashion. And then that same information that we use at that time of care, we add to that the, the care that we provide so that this record continues to build and it flows with the patient. So if we flip the coin on the other side, when they get to the emergency department or they get to their clinic the next week, they can see what happened when the EMS event occurred, uh, how uh, the care was provided and what uh, the disposition or what the instructions that were provided from EMS were for that specific event. So if we do all of this, then the goal is, is this information moves and it flows in a timely fashion. So we're not spending time looking for it. We get to spend time, uh, actually more hand time on the patients. We also can move this information in a way that it decreases our documentation time because much of this documentation gets added as part of the history where we just add to our component of what we did beyond that. And at the same time, by having a common source of this information, we're not reinventing it. We're not having to requery it from the patient or, or look it through their pill bottles and all of those kinds of things to get that information. We actually reduce our medical errors and become more efficient in the process. I think the next, uh, and, and this is a, a link I think that we have to consider uh, because this is always a part of our EMS operations, 
Uh, and also, I think with mobile integrated healthcare or community paramedicine becoming more and more prominent today, um, we have to consider the concept that EMS is not necessarily going to be transporting a patient as their endpoint. Um, I want to thank Jeff Beeson, um, Michael Potts, and, and Heath Wright <coughs> from uh, Fort Worth for uh, helping to contribute and write this section of the, uh, the data supplement. But the idea here with mobile integrated healthcare, and it also uh, is very similar to uh, concepts of mass gatherings or public events, is that EMS is functioning in a realm of where they are managing a patient, uh, but the endpoint of that care is not necessarily a transport. The endpoint is based on the need of the patient as opposed to uh, dropping the patient off at another healthcare provider. So with this type of mobile integrated healthcare or uh, community paramedicine, our goal is to improve the health of the community. And that means that we take care of patients based on those patients' needs. Uh, we see a lot of implementations with mobile integrated healthcare on uh, injury prevention, uh, trying to keep the community healthy, trying to decrease injuries. Uh, we also see a lot of this on uh, improving uh, the healthcare service um, across healthcare providers, and often this might be uh, making sure that uh, patients that were just discharged from the hospital with high-risk conditions like heart failure or asthma or diabetes receive some outpatient follow-up to make sure they don't bounce back to the hospital and they get their medications filled and they, they follow their, their discharge instructions that were provided uh, by their healthcare provider. Uh, part of this also <coughs> you know, can uh, move into areas where um, addressing things like mental health and um, frequent uh, EMS users and others which tend to dilute our resources and make it more difficult to get to the calls that truly need an emergent response or an emergent EMS care. Uh, these are the kinds of things that mobile health care and the use of data and technology uh, can be applied to improve our service delivery and our system of care. And then finally, uh, Rob Lawrence uh, did a great job of outlining all of the types of software and data that are key and important to us for our operations. Um, and I, I really think he uh, outlined this uh, both in the title as well as his uh, his bullets within the article very well. Um, he talks about scheduling and the use of software to maintain uh, what is the most important or the most expensive asset that you have, which is your people, uh, to make sure that your staffing is appropriate, uh, make sure that your ships are filled, or excuse me, are filled, and make sure that you meet the demands uh, of your operations and your call volume. Uh, he also uh, spent a fair amount of time talking about billing and uh, you know, some of the history that uh, many of us were volunteers uh, up until 10 or 15 years ago, and we've, for the most part as an industry, have now all shifted towards doing some kind of billing for our services. And so certainly that is a very software-dependent uh, endeavor, uh, and certainly the ability to quickly generate a bill and make sure that you get paid in a timely fashion are critical to keeping your cash flow and your operations uh, uh, fully uh, functional. Uh, there is starting to be a lot of software that monitors both vehicle maintenance as well as supplies and understanding um, where vehicles are. Uh, actually, there's a lot of, of data that is very good on the, the transportation industry to understand how vehicles should be maintained and how to preempt uh, vehicle failures by just maintaining basic maintenance requirements. So tracking these through data and software improves our ability to keep our fleet longer and it also improves our ability to make sure that we can meet our response requirements and our uh, clinical and operational needs as well. On the supply side, uh, it's often very expensive, uh, well, it's not often, it is always very expensive to keep supplies uh, that you don't need or don't, won't use for uh, several weeks or months. So an understanding of how you're using supplies, what pace you're using supplies, and this includes medications, which are even more expensive typically than, than basic supplies, 
that how do you manage those and how can you uh, proactively plan to keep your supplies at an adequate but not at an overstocked uh, level can make a big difference in your uh, margins and in your bottom line from an operational perspective. And then finally, uh, he discusses education and credentialing and just the need to have software to help make sure that you are um, mon monitoring and managing your EMS professionals so that uh, you're not caught in a scenario to where um, you know, professionals are out on the street and their credentials expired or they haven't met your educational requirements uh, or uh, maybe just clinically they need some assistance or some attention to make sure that they're uh, providing a level of care that your institution or your organization expects. All of these are software areas which, uh, where there are several products and, and opportunities to, to really assist you from an operational perspective. So in closing, um, then we'll get to some questions if we have some time here. I just wanted to point that back to the, my initial slides where I said EMS is the practice of medicine. Um, all of these things that we have talked about uh, really just cement that concept. Uh, this is a triangle which you often see with healthcare reform, and it's often referred to as the triple aim. And this is actually um, uh, part of the, uh, the structural uh, documentation for uh, starting to move healthcare forward uh, by uh, Agency of Healthcare Quality as well as as uh, several other uh, foundational uh, efforts on the private side or nonprofit side. But our goal is to improve a patient's experience, and experience is defined as their quality of care as well as their satisfaction. While we also improve population health or the health of our community, and at the same time providing both high quality care and improved population health, we do that with a reduced cost. One of the ways, and really the only way, that we can monitor and see a positive movement in improving our care, improving our health at a lower cost, is through the use of data systems and through the use of health information exchange and integrating all of the healthcare providers so that they are focused across a patient event as opposed to considering each patient event by each provider its own single siloed entity. So this is our future. We really do need to adopt it. It does require technology. It does require data. Uh, but this, to me, is the data and the technology chain of survival that we all have to embrace and, and implement within our agencies. So thank you, and I'll stop and hand back to Shannon. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Mears, for an excellent presentation. We do have several questions, so we'll go ahead and take a couple um, because we do have a couple minutes. Uh, the first question comes from Trent in Pennsylvania, and he asks, how do we encourage other agencies and facilities to become motivated to transition to automated real-time data transfer and sharing by means of hospital information system inter interface interfaces when most agencies and facilities seem reluctant to change at this point? Wow, one question that I could dissect into probably 20. Um, this is, I think, the crux of how we move forward is that we do have to motivate those around us uh, and those that we connect to from a healthcare perspective to understand the importance of this information exchange in the interface. And to be honest with you, the challenge that we have right now with EMS and getting electronic transfer of information into and out of hospitals is partially not being visible, but also it's partially because of the uh, health information exchange requirements that have been pushed onto hospitals and clinics right now that they're still trying to get uh, implemented. Uh, there are, uh, has been funding to hospitals and clinics based on uh, the implementation of meaningful use, and this is really moving towards electronic health records, but also uh, implementing things like ICD-10, and really upgrading a lot of the infrastructure that they require for, excuse me, for electronic records. So whenever you meet the government's court requirements for meaningful use, then you have been eligible historically for federal financing and funding. 
uh, through grants to do that. Uh, EMS was never included in this process, so have never been able to receive funds. It's interesting because we actually, in many ways, are further ahead than the rest of healthcare in implementing many of these things. But a lot of the challenge is educating the healthcare facilities and institutions that this information is, exchange is important when they have all these other things on their plate. And so it just requires education. It requires, I think, some partners. And that may be the emergency department. It may be the specialists like the cardiologist or the trauma surgeons. But those people that operate within that system of care that we've been talking about should be our allies and pulling them together with us to help motivate the hospitals and get EMS to the table I think is critical to move this stuff forward. But you're absolutely right. It's not moving fast enough and the brick wall that most of us hit is trying to get the hospitals to allow us to send them data and then to send data back even if we have a NEMSIS based software that could do that using the HL7 uh, CDA uh, today. Uh, getting them to implement it is still still a challenge. Absolutely. Uh, sort of on a, on a slightly related note, an, an, another um, participant, Dale from Oregon, says that um, he was unsuccessful in getting GMs on star to send crash information to their dispatch or the fire department to be forwarded to the responding ambulances and just wonders if you have any suggestions. You know, the GM OnStar is one of a couple of different telematics providers for crash information from vehicles. And I know that OnStar itself has been a very strong partner to EMS over the last several years in trying to identify the best way for this information to be sent. And when you think about it, it's, it's, it would seem to be straightforward, but it's really very complicated because um, in order to get this data to the right location, you know, they know where the vehicle crash ha happened. They don't always successfully understand what jurisdiction or what uh, service area they're in from that crash perspective. And then even then, the dispatch centers often uh, are remote or it's difficult to determine which dispatch center is, is associated with that EMS agency or jurisdiction once they map those together. So as they started rolling this out, these kinds of issues have made them, um, I think, really relook and reanalyze how they send this information out. And to be honest with you, I'm not an expert on what their current solution is, uh, but I you know, would encourage you to, uh, uh, one, I think check with your state EMS office and, and then also uh, just uh, contacting OnStar itself. It sounds like maybe you've already done that to get an understanding of what their plan is for your geographic location uh, can sometimes give you a clue as to, to who to talk to and how to problem solve that. Great, thank you. We'll take one more question because we are running out of time. And this comes from Will all the way in Ireland. Um, do you see de data protection as an obstruction to this integrated approach? And if so, how easily can it be overcome? I think that data protection, such as HIPAA, um, is one where it is often used as a reason not to do this. But certainly, the use of data in the provision of health care is within the scope of using data, and HIPAA does not prohibit that. HIPAA also encourages and does not prohibit the use of data for performance improvement or quality management. So through either of those venues, EMS has the right to access the data for a patient that they're caring for or have cared for. And it's just a matter of education. We often see HIPAA used, but it's used sort of as a crutch or as an excuse to not allow this to happen. And you know, Clay Mann, I think I saw he's one of the guys on the call uh, who manages the NEMSIS Technical Assistance Center. He has done an awful lot in the implementation of NEMSIS to make sure that there's documentation to show that it's perfectly fine for this data to be used uh, for uh, the care and evaluation of care um, in exchange with other health care facilities. Um, we continue to do that as, as, as a co corporate entity uh, with our products. Uh, certainly, uh, state EMS offices who have been implementing EMS data systems have been 
waving that flag for a long time. So really there is no excuse for HIPAA to, to keep this from happening anymore. It's an educational issue and there should be plenty of tools and plenty of those uh, are plenty of people out there that will wave the flag to uh, debunk that if that becomes uh, the issue that, that this health information exchange is not being implemented. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, as we wrap up, do you have any final words for our audience? Thank you for uh, hanging in there for this time. It was enjoyable. I appreciate the time and the opportunity to talk to everyone. Well, we really appreciate your time and, and sharing your knowledge with us as well. And I want to thank everyone on the call today for participating as well as to all of our sponsors for their support in making this educational opportunity available to you. Um, you, you heard Dr. Mears reference the GEMS special supplement several times during the course of this presentation. And I wanted to let everybody know that is available on our website, gems.com slash special slash data hyphen drives hyphen care. Um, so I, that, that is a supplement that's really packed with a lot of information and I recommend that, that you access that page and if you're looking for to get a little bit more information on some of the topics that Dr. Mears addressed today. Thanks everybody uh, uh, for participating and for attending and we hope to see you back for another webcast very soon. Thank you everyone. Good.